Hello and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be looking at other methods for calculating vapour pressure uh, besides equations of state. At the end of this video you'll be able to identify the limitations of clausius clapeyron type equations and select an appropriate equation for predicting vapour pressure. Now the starting point for, for looking at this is the criteria that we've been using through this section that the Gibbs free energy between phases is equal. Now if the Gibbs free energy between those phases is equal then any small shift away uh, or any small change in temperature with that will bring a small change in Gibbs free energy of the phases but it has to be the same change otherwise it's not going to stay in equilibrium. So, so while staying in equilibrium then we can say that instead of Gibbs free energy we're going to work in volume and uh, entropy and so that's just substituting in the, the fundamental uh, equation that we used uh, in previous lectures there and so so what we get then is uh, is this equation here and so if we then uh, bring some terms to the other side okay so we've got our volume terms here bring this over here bring this entropy term over the other side here then we can divide by dt and we end up with our partial differential equation here which relies on our system being at equilibrium okay that gives free energy the same between phases and gives us delta s on delta v and we know that the delta s is in fact equal to delta h on t for a phase change and so what all this gives us then is the Clapeyron equation which says that the rate of change of saturation pressure is going to be equal to the enthalpy of phase change divided by temperature and divided by the volume change of transition and so if we look at applying this to something okay so if we have a look at the case of uh, tin okay so so we're looking at tin and uh, the heat of fusion of tin is uh, 58.6 joules per gram at 505 Kelvin and at one bar and so I also know that as it goes from a solid to a liquid that the volume change is uh, 0 0.00389 centimeters cubed per gram. So what is the melting temperature if the pressure is increased a thousand times from one bar to 100 megapascals? Okay, and so we can do this by looking at the Clapeyron equation. And so to start off, what we're going to do is assume that the uh, that the enthalpy of phase change and the volume of phase change is going to stay constant and so if we go back to our Clapeyron equation so this equation here then we can bring the dt over to the other side and then because I've assumed that these two terms up here in yellow are constant then I can bring these outside the box here and then it becomes quite a simple integration on the left hand side I'm just integrating dp on the the right hand side I'm just integrating 1 on t to t now substituting all this in and remembering to keep my units as being matching okay so to um, to convert these both into to kilograms or joules per kilogram and meters cubed per kilogram then if I do the calculation okay so uh, take the exponential of both sides uh, make t my subject 
then what I get is my final temperature here, okay, is 508 Kelvin or 508.4 Kelvin. So at 100 megapascals, the melting temperature has only changed compared to what I started at by 3 Kelvin. Okay, so, so this justifies the assumptions that we've made previously about solids being incompressible and that sort of thing. Okay, so, but this does a pretty good job of predicting that when we use constant uh, enthalpy of melting and constant volume of melting. Now, if in addition to assuming that the uh, enthalpy of transition and the uh, volume change of transition are constant, Okay, sometimes, and if we're looking at gas phase equilibrium, then sometimes it's useful to assume that the gas phase is ideal. So, so many, many things have uh, gas liquid equilibrium at low pressure. So water at room temperature is a classic example. It only has a couple of kilopascals of uh, vapor pressure. And so when we do that, then we get a couple of things. So one of them is, is that the volume of the gas is way, way bigger than the volume of the liquid. And then therefore, that change in volume is equal to the volume of the gas. And of course, I can just make that equal to my uh, volume according to the ideal gas law. If I substitute these things in to the Clapeyron equation, then what I get is is a is a quite simplified equation to compared to what I had before. So, so if I substitute in here, and remembering that I'm assuming that the heat of vaporization is constant, then I get my clausius clapeyron equation here. And so this is probably familiar from previous courses. And so what's important to remember is that this is for an ideal gas and for vapor liquid equilibrium only. And so whilst this has some limitations, it immediately shows us a number of things. And so the most important thing is, is that the vapor pressure changes exponentially with temperature. And so, and so this is why you have to be really careful about the temperatures that you have for systems that have liquids in them. Because if you increase the temperature by 10 degrees, you may be doubling or tripling the vapor pressure, which has an enormous effect uh, on vessels and stuff like that. Now, if we look at how well these different assumptions are, so that this stays constant and that my transition volume stays constant, what I'm going to look at here is some data for uh, for ammonia. So this is uh, vapor liquid data for ammonia. And so on the left hand side here we have the, uh, the heat of vaporization and we see that as the temperature changes from uh, roughly 200 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin that the heat of vaporization changes enormously from uh, 25 kilojoules per mole down to less than 5 kilojoules per mole. And if we have a look at the volume change, then the volume change that occurs is uh, quite big as well, or it changes quite a lot as our temperature changes from 200 Kelvin up to 400 Kelvin. Okay, so, so we have to exercise a, a degree of caution with the clausius clapeyron equation. It only applies over small uh, temperature ranges. Okay. If we want to have a look at bigger temperature ranges, then we need to add some complexity to it. So, so if we start with the clausius clapeyron equation, then we can add an additional parameter to it and we get this equation on the right and this is called the Antoine equation and so the Antoine equation is uh, based on the clausius clapeyron equation but it's slightly empirical but it's a very common equation to use and so so in this table here from Koretsky we'll get a range of 
Anton constants, okay, A, B, and C, and you simply substitute those back up into this equation here to get your vapor pressure. Now, a very, very important thing to look at in this table is the range of pressures here. Okay, and we can see that for for some of these things, so for, for methane, let's say, the range of applicability is very, very small. If we have a look at acetylene, the Antoine equation is actually only applicable over an 8 degree range, very small range. So if we want to have a look at a bigger range, then we need a better equation. And so one equation that's commonly used is the Riddell equation. And so that's simply given here. And so what we get is we get we've got a five parameter equation for the vapor pressure. And so it's not any surprise that if we've got all these extra terms, all these extra fitting parameters, that the Riddell equation does a much better job over a much larger pressure range than the Antoine equation. And so so this table here is from Perry's and so they list all the different parameters. And of course, again, they also list the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature that this equation applies over. And so we can see that we tend to get much wider temperature ranges compared with what we saw with just the Antoine equation. And so if we, if we look at all these things together then, then what we can look at here on the left hand side is I've got the log of the vapour pressure versus a uh, 1000 divided by the temperature or just, just one on temperature here. And so if we look at this plot here, then the fit between the different equations, so the, the Antoine equation, the Riddell equation from Perry's or using the clausius clapeyron equation with a single starting point, these all seem to be quite reasonable. Now, if we have a look at a linear plot on the right hand side, then what we see is, so we've got the data here, so with the, the circles, and so the dotted line is from Perry's, and that fits the data very, very well. But if we have a look at the clausius clapeyron equation, or the Antoine equation, we've actually got significant errors in this high pressure region, okay, and in this, this high temperature region, or it's a high temperature for ammonia. Okay, and so, so what we see from this is that, that one, don't just look at log plots, okay, because log plots can be very misleading, and they can make things look very close when they're not. And the second thing is, is that equations apply over a particular range. Always check the range of applicability before you use an equation, particularly in a vapour pressure calculation, which is very, very important. Okay, so to conclude what we've done in this video, the clausius clapeyron equation has a limited range of applicability. It should be used with caution. There are other tabulated equations for vapour pressure, but they also should be checked against data where possible. Okay, thanks for your time.